gentlemen, welcome to another episode of Recording This Program, Savvy Seeks, me being Dr. Savvy. And I'm, as per normal, we've got fantastic guests as uh, we try to round them up during the week. <laughs> and uh, in the week, we, uh, we look at the current affairs. And every week, we try and consider a topic of, I guess, uh, something that would uh, affect Seeks, something that is thought-provoking, something that would make you consider or reconsider what you're doing right now in your lives. And so what we're going to talk about this week is I thought we would uh, consider whether Siki is actually being rebranded. Um, are we aware of the, uh, I guess, the dangers of ritualism? And also, is there a line between religion and culture? So I okay, always have an opportunity to have brilliant guests. And Gurpreet, it's so good for you to be here again. Thank you. Yes. You know, you, in yes. secretly, you are going to be my backup person <laughs> if, I, if I can't do a show, uh, which might be the case in about two, three weeks' time. Worry, we've got your back covered. Yeah, thanks very much. <laughs> yeah, I, shall, I shall look at it if I can. You know. um, but I'd like the guests to introduce themselves uh, one by one. I was um, in here. Vani uh, is uh, Gore is here, and also Chubchi Gore is here as well. But please introduce yourselves. Tell us where you come from. Why are you here? <laughs> I'm Gurpreet Singh and uh, I'm on the committee of Central Gurdwara London, the oldest Gurdwara in Europe. And uh, I'm here because, uh, well, Savvy drags me out every Friday. Mm. So over to you, Vinny. Not because there's nothing else better that you can do to spend your Friday nights no. chilling in the studio. Friday nights on the Seek channel is a place to be. <laughs> we shall pay you later for paying. <laughs> <laughs> um, fire away, Vinny. My name is Vineet Kaur and um, I'm a Kundalini yoga teacher and I'm also a nutrition advisor and Gurpreet is very kind to invite me so it's a very nice topic and that's why I'm here. Thanks, Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, we hope you contribute. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. so. <laughs> Jebji, good to see you. Satnam. Um, I'm Jebji Kaur, I'm from Belgium, um, not living in London but moving here in the near future. Um, I'm a Kundalini yoga teacher as well. I'm quite new into Sikhi two years, one and a half year, and I got tracked down by Vineet, so it's basically <laughs> it's like one by one. one. Yeah. Yeah. Effect. I yeah, you, absolutely, you Vinny, yeah, Vinny it's sort of the domino you. effect, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah. we end up spending our Friday here together. Yeah. Well, I hope it will be an enjoyable Friday. So just to go back to the topic area that we're heading out about, we want to talk about ritualism, and I, I just must share with you that a conversation that I had some, with somebody like literally a couple of hours ago, and someone said to me, well, it's up to the people, isn't it? They can do whatever they want to do. Right? It's up to them to be intelligent enough to decide whether or not it's the right thing or not quite the right thing to do. My issue is more about the fact that uh, is it something that's um, slowly infiltrating and affecting Sikhi in terms of its purity? Um, what, do you, what do you think about that, Guru Well, see, Sikhism, if we look at the beginning, what did Guru Nanak do? He broke the chains of ritualism, these chains that made us slaves. Mm. He, made, he, he gave us azadi, he gave us freedom. And it's, if we want to then go back today and start putting these chains of slavery back onto ourselves, then that's our misfortune. Because if you want to get into ritualism, there are plenty of people who will make money out of you, who will look to scam you, who will look to use you and abuse you. At the moment, you have freedom and you should enjoy that freedom and use that freedom to join with God. It's just to clarify, as Sikhs, we, we don't do fasts, we don't do, um, you know, things mm. like Dikka and that kind of stuff, you know, and, and, the, and there are reasons for that, it's because I think at the time, Guru Nanak, and it kind of continued all the way through, right up to modern time, we hope, that, you know, we are free from the superstition aspect, because we believe yes. that it doesn't actually do anything, it, like you said, it, it binds you, you know, um, there should be um, a freer spirit. Yeah. Um, do, you, do you think that's the case? Well, these things have become a barrier, so if people start adopting them again, uh, you right. know, occasionally you, you're starting to see some Sikhs who are adopting uh, ritualism right. again. And uh, you see it coming in many different ways. Yes, you may see the traditional Indian versions coming of it, mm. but you also get uh, other things. You know, people uh, start maybe doing their part in a different way, thinking that, ah, this will maybe help me. You know, it's a... Uh, all these different things. I, I actually ran into one odd problem when I was a young lad. I went to one Sikh camp and I made the mistake of wearing a red turban that day and I discovered these people didn't like the colour red. They mm. said it incited lustful thoughts. Right. I had no idea why. You know, if they cut themselves... I have to tell you, when I was at school, I'd give you to say to me, 
uh, you're wearing a blue turban today and, and the yeah. next day I was wearing a burgundy one. And I said, how, did you, how come you changed the colour of your turban? And I said, well, the other one's in the wash. <laughs> <laughs> See, people that start associating colours with ritualism, the Jat Sub tells you, God sees no colour. Right, yeah. absolutely. It, everything is created by God. Mm. You know, there's nothing that isn't God. Uh, you know, there are no barriers, there are no uh, superstitions, but it's our manmat that brings it back in. Mm -hmm. But you go back to the point that isn't it up to the people to be sensible enough to decide what they should or shouldn't do in terms of whether it's appropriate or not? Or do they do it because it becomes habitual, it's like they've always done it, therefore they'll carry on doing it, uh, and then they see no difference? Or maybe they kind of start imagining that if they don't do it, bad things are going to happen, you know? Are you talking about the slave mentality here? Well, I guess what it is is possibly, you know, it goes back to the fear thing, doesn't it? You know, you're, you're fearful of, well, you know, if you don't do a certain thing, it's going to affect you somehow right. in terms of your karma or whatever. You is know? fear good? Well, we, we are supposed to be fearless, aren't we? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, so, you know, you want to break away from fear. So why right. adopt something which only enhances your fear, saying that if I'm without this, then I'm in a bad situation? Yeah, but I think the, the problem that you have in a in society is that there are people that influence other people. So if we take a wedding, for example, somebody might say, you must do this because, what, they, they won't say that um, it's because she, she said or he said, it's because we've always done it, or it's been mm -hmm. a family tradition, yeah. or the fact is that if you don't do it, then this may happen to you. Um, the coconut stuff and all the other things that, that kind of go on, you know. Um, I mean, there's obviously there's dangers there with that, that creeps in. And I think the fear is the main element. And I think um, that's probably in every religion really what mm -hmm. it's about. Do you feel empowered? Mm. And I think, like for me personally, when I was left by coming into Kundalini Yoga, what I felt was I felt really empowered. Because when I went to Hispaniola and I met a lot of the Kundalini Yoga teachers there, and you know we were quite fortunate to stay at Guru Kasi and Guru Kakor's house, and you know we sort of spent time with all the, all the women there. I felt that they were very empowered, mm. and um, you know, they had a practice that helped them to feel empowered because, you know, like, for example, we do the tuning in, we do the mantras, we understand why we cover our head, we understand about the energy, and then also there are very important things in Kundalini Yoga to talk about, for example, conscious pregnancy. So, um, you know, before I had my baby, fortunately, I, had, I was blessed to be part of the golden chain, and then we could instill those um, into our children as well, into our home, into our society. Right. And we can do seva, like for example, when I was teaching at the addiction center, and I saw how the teachings help the students, and that's uh, what brings that faith into the teachings. It's interesting actually, because I've seen, uh, I think I saw a documentary, and a lot of people that were over in the US who had started practicing Kundalini Yoga, they actually became Sikhs themselves, didn't mm -hmm. they? they had the Kundalini thing was separate, the Sikhi thing was separate. It just yeah. kind of like, it just kind of emerged from that. They thought, yeah. well, Yogi Bhajan is actually a Sikh. So, and then Yogi Bhajan yeah. himself was saying things like, I look around and suddenly they're all becoming Sikhs. What's going on? Yeah, you know? I mean, the people think that Yogi Bhajan went to America and then they became Sikhs. He just went there and he just shared what he had to share, the religion. Right. Uh, and the, sorry, the yoga. Right. And a lot of times what happens, and this happens in our classes as well, because the teachers want, the students want to become like the teachers. Because oh, really? Okay. Obviously they see uh, the practice and they see what you're omitting. And that's why Yogi Bhajan kept saying that don't focus on the teacher, focus on the mm -hmm. teachings. That's mm -hmm. why we have the tuning in and we focus on the teachings. Right. But sometimes students are so much in love with the teachings and then they get very connected to the teacher. And that's why you're right that, you know, they go to the Sikhi because obviously they see the practice that the teacher has and, um, you know, the empowerment. On the other hand, just the experience of the yoga and of merging your consciousness with the universal consciousness can bring you to Sikhi. That's what that happened with me. Neither of, I had two Kundalini Yoga teachers, neither of them were Sikh, but I got into Sikhi through Kundalini Yoga. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't always, it's not always a case of mirroring, mirroring your teacher, trying to become your teacher. It can just be the experience that brings you on a spiritual path. And Sikhi is that path of a seeker. It's, it's, for me, when I came into Sikhi, it was quite weird to see a lot of the rituals or the superstitions, because in you, coming you into it, that? I had the idea that there was nothing... But you like that? that. Yeah, you, I you did. saw that? Yeah, yeah, I heard people saying, like, um, if you have a brother, you can't wash your hair on a Friday. <laughs> <laughs> what is that about? And I see nothing. Okay. <laughs> is it a Thursday or something? It's a day. Like, just pick a day. You just can't wash your own this day. Any of these little things. Exactly. Yeah. So when I came to Siki, for me, it was 
like the most open path and the most truthful one to yourself and to God without anything in between. Right. Mm. But then you do see that, that are, there are quite a few cultural things in yeah. between. Um, and then how many of them do you adopt? Like with every single one of them, you sort of take a step back and you see like, does it affect me? Does it help me? No? Right. Okay, then I just leave it. One of the things that we were talking about just in the green room, mm. there is such a thing, uh, we were talking about the fact that, you know, we're, we're born in the UK, mm -hmm. okay, which is, I mean, there are people that have been here for even many years, maybe they were not one or two years old, and there's now third generation mm -hmm. as well. And sometimes I feel that we've got culture that's over here in the UK. Mm -hmm. And if I go to India, people will go to me, say to me things like, well, you speak to us Punjabi slightly different. And I feel, I feel like right, all these people that come from India, that they know Gurmukhi, they know Punjabi, aren't they so rich in the fact that they know all this, right? Mm -hmm. um, and you're you come into Sikhi and, and we were just saying earlier on, you want to learn Gurmukhi, don't Absolutely, you? Absolutely. Because yeah. you want to learn about the essence of, the, yeah. of what the true Nama is. It is means, the language right? of the Gurus. It is yeah. the language of Guru Granth Sahib. Right. So it is the language that you will learn if you come sure. into Sikhi. But then we'll be part Do I want to speak Punjabi at home? That's a different question. Absolutely. I would like my children to grow up and know Punjabi and start learning Gurmukhi. Right. But do they need to know every vegetable in Punjabi? I don't think so. Okay. Um, but yeah. when I go to Gurdwara, I do feel it as not only not being fluent in Gurmukhi yet, but not speaking Punjabi is a big hindrance because I can't listen to the Katha. Right. Um, I can't speak to a lot of the people because quite a lot of the elders still speak Punjabi, especially right. in Belgium. Everybody basically only speaks Punjabi. Right. So it is like a, a huge barrier right. um, if you're not Punjabi to come into Sikhi. Okay. Um, but you know, in a way, I mean, I suppose in the UK... It's and different. it shouldn't be. Yeah. In the, in in the, the UK, UK it is very, different. very different. Yeah, yeah, because in the absolutely. UK, a lot of people do speak yeah. Punjabi and they speak yeah. English. Yeah. And they speak, yeah. you know. Punjabis hold a franchise on Sikhism, or is Sikhism universal? I, my personal belief is that Sikhism is universal. Mm -hmm. I don't think there is a, a point about the fact that, you know, you have to be Punjabi to be Sikh. No. Mm -hmm. Or once you become Sikh, you suddenly become Punjabi, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Because I think they're two separate things, because yeah. I was brought up in Bombay, and... Right. Um, I do not have any Punjabi friends. I mean, we did go a lot to okay. the Gurdwara, mm. but my friends, because the place where I was brought up in the school I went to, mm. there was no Sikhs there. Okay. And I was very, very fortunate because my father took us to, um, and that's why I believe traveling is, you know, the best form of education. Right, absolutely. Because we went to Hazur Sahib, we went yep. to Hermandir Sahib. Good place. And, um, you know, we, we were, like, taught a lot about Sikhi at home, like, because mm. we went to an English medium school, but... We were taught at home, you know, to read, the, um, you know, about Sikhi and also Punjabi as well. My parents spoke mm. to us in Punjabi. But I personally feel um, I'm very glad, in a way, that I was brought, brought up in a mixed environment mm -hmm. because we had very good friends from various communities. And I think my parents, in a way, didn't really have to teach us to respect different communities. That's what Sikhi is about. Mm -hmm. we, we because go back we, to in a way, we had, that's how we were, you know, brought up. Yeah. But you're intelligent enough to, that you had that, you know, you had that thought in your mind that, um, you weren't saying you weren't being rebellious and saying, okay, I must only speak English, or I don't want to learn about this culture. I mean, there are many people. I mean, I'm talking about people that I know in who who are in India who go and t take their kids to say a Roman Catholic school, maybe because it happens to be the fact that those schools are some of the best schools mm -hmm. yeah. right now. It's good that they'll probably learn about Christianity, but will they necessarily also respect their own religion as well? Mm -hmm. I don't I don't know. I mean, if, from I your that's personal experiences, do yeah. they? You went to, well, we I guess, went a, a, to, uh, was it a convent or that kind yeah, of... Yeah, I mean, we went to private school, which was... N uh, we were taught a lot of it, you know, like, for example, Father God, Thou art in yeah. heaven. I mean, we had yeah. to do that every Absolutely. day. Yeah. And then I went to um, a Catholic college as well. Right. And my brother went to a Catholic... He went to a uh, Christian school. But my father was very um, clear. I mean, he spoke to his... Especially my brother, he spoke to the teacher, because, you know, they were talking about biblical studies. And he said, look, I don't think my son needs to be you know, involved in any of that, so he didn't mm. go to the chapel, sort of right. thing. And um, I think the good thing is that my parents didn't, I think now when I look back, they didn't instill that fear element. Mm. So it's like we were in the environment, because my brother went to an environment where there were more Christians than, than I did. Right. But there was no fear element, and it was very clear. Like, he was the only, only person there wearing a turban, but right. my parents made it a point to explain to him why we're doing this. Okay. And there were, I think there were some difficulties when we were growing up, because to me, um, you know, I, I did wonder sometimes, oh, hang on a second, why, why can't we do this, and why can't we do that, and all the rest of it. And my parents did try, but mm. now, moving to England, I feel actually more connected in a way, because, um, you know, because my husband, he's, he's really into Sikhi as well. Right. 
and also there's lots of um, you know like you go to Park Avenue you have Simran there there is so much Sikhi mm-hmm. in England which really amazed mm-hmm. me I, I did not expect that and the other thing I feel is that there are a lot of people here who really have researched about Sikhi like there's so much information now on the internet um, you know even with the yoga I understand a lot about the the power of like why why the kirpan why the case what you know what it helps us and you can feel that empowerment right so the whole aspect of empowerment i think is a very western um you know sort of a western culture really because also being a nutrition advisor i can see in the indian culture there is a little bit of the fear element and you know um, the sort of following element but in western culture i felt there's a lot of empowerment so it's, I think it's interesting you mentioned the kind of the food thing because you know, if you go to Gurdwara, you get, you know, I always think that someone said to me once, the reason why the food tastes so good in the Gurdwara is because it's blessed. Yeah. You know, I think I really believe that. I think it is. You know, and it just says. And the desi kyo. And the desi kyo. <laughs> <Very> good. <laughs> okay. Apart from that. Um, but so, so food is a thing, isn't it? A cultural thing, isn't it? Yes, of Do course. It's, it's very important. Yeah. <laughs> you can get started on the gluten yeah. and the dairy. Yeah. <laughs> because you know, there's like there's diet in the North Indian part, right, which is mm-hmm. specific. And a diet in the in the UK, right? Yes, and it's very different, isn't it? Or di- diet in the West, we would argue. It's right? interesting because when we met, uh, we didn't know, but we just started talking. I, I remember we were at Bournemouth and she took out her gluten-free cookies and I said, oh my God, you're into gluten-free. And she goes, oh my God, I didn't know you were. But you do, you do attract what you emit. And um, I think food is really important. And I think people are realizing now, like, for example, we just had the rice. And obviously they are seeing the connection. I mean, today if you go to the superstores, you get so much processed food. Right. You get so much. You know, like people don't, don't realize the value of organic food. Mm. And interestingly, talking about Punjab or, for example, I'm from Bombay, it's a very light, like Bombay, is, there's so much light. Mm. There's so much, you know, sunlight. sunlight. And in England, it's a very dark country. Right. So, obviously, when, when I moved to England, I did eat a lot of the Bombay food, and I did go out of my way to buy things from shops that came from India. But now I realize it's the energetic connection. Because in the winter time, we need to eat more sort of root vegetables like sweet potatoes, butternut squash. And in the Gudwara, you know, in the winter time, you get more sort of key, which is fine. But it's very acidic. The dairy is very, your body does struggle. Mm-hmm. But instead right. of that, if we could just get, you know, a butternut squash or a sweet potato and just make something sweet, like, you know, in India they do make with sort of, with the, you know, papaya or something, that sort of, sweet dish. It but remember, there are good things about culture, isn't it? Let's, let's kind of, you know, talk and focus more on the cultural aspects, mm-hmm. right? There are, there's culture and there's religion, right? Yes. And sometimes they have an influence on each other, right? So someone said to me once, if you look at Gutka, which is the martial arts style, is that a culture or, or is, that, uh, is that a religious connection? You know, or do they, are, you know, are they dependent on each other? You know, there are, gr- there are gray areas between both, whether it be about food, mm-hmm. whether it be about practices, you know, in terms of, you know, uh, sports and that kind of stuff. Yeah. You know, like we're just saying, you know, or a martial art. There are, there are grey areas between culture and religion. Yeah. But, you know, you, we were talking earlier on about your experiences when you yeah. go to Gurdwara, right? How um, do you feel when you, you, you go to, you've been to a few different types of Gurdwara as well? I've been to a few different types. Yeah. Um, I've been to one, for example, at the France Yoga Festival. Right. That is really a, a, a white Gurdwara. Right. Um, there is one in Amsterdam also just run by white people. Right. And I'm mostly here, I'm, I'm in Punjabi uh, Gurdwara. Right. And I must say that I do tend towards mm-hmm. Punjabi Sangat very, very much, so I hardly okay. know any other white Sikhs. Right. Um, because I do feel, on the one hand, that I need that culture to grow in my Sikhi, because all the knowledge is right there. Um, and it is very, very strengthening, in a sense. Um, on the other hand, there is a question, okay, how, how Indian do I become? Mm-hmm. Do I need to wear a Punjabi suit right. to be a Sikh? No, I don't think so. Probably not, actually. Do I need to eat roti every yeah. day or paranda? I don't like it, mm. so I don't eat it. Okay. But yeah. people will say, like, you're a Sikh, do you like paranda? Yeah. But wouldn't it be the no, same No, because thing I'm not Indian. As, like, for example, I know a bunch of kids who will like Bhangra music, right, mm. or Bangra, yeah. and they think that by liking Bhangra music, they become more Indian, yeah. or they might become more Punjabi, mm. And because Punjabi, there's a lot of people in the north, uh, in Punjabi, that are Punjab, that are Sikh, they become more Sikhi. Mm-hmm. So there's kind of like a distortion going on here yeah. about that. Um, and I see that a lot in uh, Bollywood films where you'll see a, a Bhangra routine yeah. and the lead actor will be in the front and every single person behind will be a Sikh chap, yeah. you know. 
there'll be five Sikh guys dancing Bhangra and there'll be the, the hero in the front. You know? And what kind of image is that trying to portray? Yeah. Yeah. That you're a Sikh, therefore you must do Bhangra, therefore you get better connected if you know Punjabi music. Yes. It really you know? creates a stereotype, doesn't it? You know, Am I reading too much into this? Quite it often is. you seem to see a very stereotyped Sikh or in Bollywood films. And right. uh, that's not really true, a true reflection. Of people are doing studies on it, saying, wondering why is Bollywood always portraying Sikhs in a very particular manner. Mm. And uh, it, it's a sad thing. Some of our kids watch those films and right. think, hang on, is that all we are? Mm -hmm. yeah. Is that all we can do? Just yeah. uh, bhangra, hang a kanda on our car, and uh, that's all, mm. and that's it, you're a Sikh. Although there was a film that I saw recently called Rocket Sing. I'm not a big Bollywood fan, I must admit. Uh, but I saw Rocket Singh, and that was, that was a good film. Oh, that's yeah, brilliant. Yeah, because it did show some moral aspects of being honest and the integrity of being a Sikh, right, that were beyond the boundaries of, I mean, okay, the environment of that movie was, you know, I think it was set in Bombay or somewhere, it was set in a, in a city, it was in a very kind of high-tech world, and it was a very competitive capitalist environment, but his purity came out in terms of, he wanted to do things in an honest way, mm -hmm. you know, ultimately, you know, the, the kind of message that came out was, was a good thing for Sikhs, right? Uh, because it showed the integrity of the individual and his ability to work with different cultures and respect each person that he came into connection with. And it was not just him, they, they were showing all the stereotypes, because even the, yeah. the woman in the, you know, they said that it was like, she's just being stereotyped because she was like, a certain mm. type and then they said no actually they can all do business and there was that the person who was the chai wala right and he didn't he couldn't put himself to be like one of the partners he right said, no i'll just make the tea isn't it okay yeah. so i think they were dealing with all stereotypes it was yeah. not true. well one of the things that probably coming across was the kind of uh, the, the cast issue as well that you know mm -hmm. you know you need to break out of that yeah. syndrome and, and treat each other all the same it you is know? a typical thing when you look at india there is a very much a culture of it that if you're to be a film actor, you need to be the son or daughter of a film mm. actor. Mm. To be a politician, you need to be from a politician's family. Mm. Uh, it's again, it's that slavery. Caste system again is there to s uh, enslave humanity. Right. Uh, it's, uh, it all goes hand in hand with ritualism. I think so that's everywhere. Mm. I, I wouldn't really say in, just in India. It's just simply because, um, you know, since I've been a nutrition advisor, it's very interesting. And this is something mm. we were talking about. It's like, there is a lot of fear element right. in the West as well, and it's very, very clear. What, you, what do you mean by fear element in the West? What do you mean by that? You know, that? like, for example, uh, people are afraid of, like you were talking about, the sort of ritualistic things. Yeah. They're, they're also afraid of, you know, like whatever the media says, oh, my mm. God, this is going to happen, oh, my God, this is going to happen. And they do get very scared of various things. And it's a lot to do, like, for example, the Punjabi dad and the British dad is quite similar. Mm. There is a lot of the dairy element, the gluten element, and there's not much protein and all the rest of it. Other carbos. Yeah, <laughs> well, it, it's a lot, yeah, you know, it's, it's kind of the potatoes. It's not, it's, they're yeah. not sort of having things which are growing in season. There's not much of organic food, there's not much energetic connection. Mm. So I think the fear element, it, it's, it's everywhere. It's not just in a particular country. I think it's, it's the, the whole aspect of empowerment is, I mean, you know, like, there are so many Westerners that go to India and then they get really connected and then they go into yoga or they, because the empowering technologies are actually from the East. Right. The Chinese medicine, the Ayurveda. Or maybe they have time to sit back and relax and it's not necessarily what that environment, it's not, it's not like you go to India and suddenly you're, you know, mesmerized because the smells and all the rest of it. It's just that you're stress-free. You they know, probably are. You know. they, they probably like that because uh, the other day I was leading sadhana at Chetaskush and one of the, the women, you know, she saw my baby there and, and she was like, after the sadhana, she was in tears and she said, oh, I felt like I was being held by the guru and, you know, all the rest of it. Mm -hmm. And she said that, because of the rights, she was feeling very connected and she said, I want to go to Africa or I right. want to go in. Because she just wants to run help. away from it or she feels that uh, that's going to be a place where she just it's going to be that peace? She wanted to help. Right. But that's when I told her, I said, well, if you really want to do some seva, I said, you can start here, because yeah, there absolutely. were so many riots here. Yeah. You could actually even go to the private schools and, you know, start doing a bit of mm. yoga there, because exactly. it's not in a particular country. So I think sometimes people box, I mean, you can feel, it's like the, they say the guru is in the sangha. So you can be sitting in your house and you can be in fear and you can be sitting in your house and you can be empowered. It doesn't matter. And the reason I'm saying is because I've lived in, in such a cosmopolitan city, Bombay, with being traveling other parts of you know the world and then living in England as well. So you see the same elements. So let me, let me try and summarize yeah. this. So what we're saying is that if you've got 
we originally started talking about ritualism, right? So if you've got a ritual aspect, which is like, you, you mustn't do this, but you must do this. You mustn't eat this, but you, but you, you know, if you, you you'll be, if you don't eat this, then hey, it's going to be really bad mm -hmm. for you. Or you eat this on a certain day. It's binding you as an individual. It's actually saying it's constraining you to kind of be more open and be free. What is, is that what we're saying? And if we're saying that if we break free from those things, we can focus on doing better stuff. You know? I think all of these rituals will take you away from your own experience and to finding out what is good for you, find, find your inner teacher, basically. Right. Mm -hmm. Because they're just putting you in Are a situation... I really think so, yeah. Yeah, the right. challenges, aren't they? It's all about your own experience and your own path. Sikhi is, but just your lifestyle is. Just listening within. We don't see God as something outside. It is within. So go within and don't listen from things coming outside. Right. Learn to listen within, and it, it, that holds true for all aspects in your life, I think. And if there is a good reason behind something that has become a superstition, try to find out what the reason is. Is there a technology behind it? Right. Is there, okay. there is a technology behind why we grow our hair, mm. even on our legs, why mm. we leave it, why mm. we don't cut it. But don't start doing it because everybody else is doing it. Find it out. Find out for yourself, why am I doing it? Why is this improving my life? Why is this enhancing me? Why is this empowering me? So if and anyone knows why we sh why some people don't wash their hair on a Tuesday, I'd love well, to find out. Exactly. The for but that. then share the answer with us and then maybe it makes no sense exactly. that one. <laughs> yeah. You see people do that. Or I don't eat something on a Saturday. And but if there is no <laughs> good reason for it, yeah. then why yeah. would you do it? Why, because why it's been done it? for it for yeah. generations? No. Where do we get that guidance from though? We get the guidance from Guru Granth Sahib, right? We get the guidance yeah. from, you know, doing more reading and you're gonna do you're gonna learn Gurmukhi, which is fantastic. Mm -hmm. So you'll actually get some essence from there. Mm -hmm. And the Gurdwara's got a part to play in actually oh, saying so we, to we, people, maybe it's not a good idea for you to do this at a wedding. Maybe it's not a good idea for you to, uh, you know, for us to kind of carry out this request that you're asking, which is pretty non sicky I mean, you get those kind of requests coming yes, in? Yes, we do that, Shepherd Bush Gurdwara. We have people requesting all sorts of things that we have to literally turn them down on that. You cannot do this in a Gurdwara. If you want to go do it in your own home, that's fine, but you cannot do this in the Gurdwara. We have a responsibility to impart the knowledge of the Guru Granth Sahib and also to uphold those values. There's no point in just going... When you say in the when you go to the Gurdwara is advising, who's advising? Is it the person at the front who's doing the kappa? Is it the person who's doing the, after the Hukam Nama does a, a speech? Several, you know? It has to be in several ways. One is, is it a committee that's supposed to say something? We have Kirtan going on, which is a Shabbat. Right. And again, that, uh, I realize the importance of translation there. Again, Katha. And Katha shouldn't just be on safe and simple topics, which keeps everyone yeah. happy. We need to look at the it wider uh, elements in our lives. Mm. And also, uh, you know, the grunties we have at the Gurdwara need to be doing one-to-one -one work with individual Sangat members. Do they understand the background of people that live in the UK? When they, and they, when they give examples, do they give examples of everyday context, you know, uh, of issues associated with, you know, everyday problems or everyday opportunities to be a better person? Are they giving those examples? Uh, speaking from the Agudwara, I know that our Grunty is asked some very wide and weird questions mm. and things that we as a committee wouldn't even expect. I know he has to deal with plenty of things confidentially. If Sangat members do approach him with inquiries or problems they're having, it's got to be dealt with uh, confidentially. But uh, there's one, this is one interesting element here, because it comes down to the Miri Kiri concept. So we have the spiritual side, yes, we've got Guruji there, Guru Granth Sahibji is there, but we're not act, we've not enabled the actual, uh, the uh, temporal side. Every Gurdwara should have Panj Piyare there. That is a temporal representation of Guruji. And you should be able to go and ask Panj Piyare for advice. If you're uh, uh, an Amritari Sikh, you would go ask your Panj Piyare. But how often do you go to a Gurdwara and find Panj Piyare available for you to take your guidance right. from? Mm -hmm. And I always find that when you have five Khalsa come together, the advice they give you will be the right advice. 
That's a good point, yeah. I think that is something I think all our gurdwaras in across the world need to be adopting. We mm -hmm. cannot just be looking at one side and saying we have to only be spiritual. We can't just be looking at the theory. We have to be also doing the meeting. Mm -hmm. Both go hand in hand in Sikhi. Both go I'll, I'll go back to, you know, we're talking about empowerment. Ultimately, you know, as a free spirit, as a person that enters and has a soul, you make your own decisions about what you think is right or what is wrong, right? And, and you get education and you decide whether you go to the dark side <laughs> or whether you stay towards the light. So I have to squeeze in a science fiction reference there. So <laughs> and all the rest of it. But now, okay, right. but now I, I don't like Pamela music. It, it's like because I love rock music. And my dad always listened to rock music when we were little. But we used to think, oh, when is he going to turn this off? Because we were interested <laughs> in other music. Yeah. So at the end of the day, the information has always been there. Mm. And now I listen to the music that my, when we were brought up. You know, my dad, he had these old cassettes and he goes, do you want them? Because I can't put them on CDs. And I'm actually listening to these cassettes with my baby growing up. And it's reminding me of what my parents, and mm -hmm. th at that time, I didn't value it. But yeah. it, the information that I'm getting now is not in a Gurdwara, it's in those cassettes that my dad's given me, you know, that are really old cassettes. Absolutely. It's like, it's, the information is there, but it's like you said, it's connecting the heart. Okay, so let's pick up this point. I did a, one more thing that I wanted to cover, actually. We've got a few minutes to cover this. There was a point that you made earlier on when we were talking outside, and we were talking about uh, Bollywood influence, mm -hmm. right? And I think you said something quite interesting. Did you say something about Hollywood? Uh, yeah, said, you asked my, me my question that. was, there's Bollywood influencing our Sikh youth today? Exactly. And my answer was, well, just as much as Hollywood is. Okay. But then, you see, that is information as well, isn't it? Yeah. You know, and, and ultimately, it's possibly the wrong kind of information mm -hmm. or information that kind of isn't, is a quick fix, you know, or is a re-establishment of ways that you should not be acting, right? So... Mm -hmm. Because it's a stronger influence in the media context than a religious aspect, because, you know, in one sense, there's more of it. Mm -hmm. It's more spoken about. Mm -hmm. If people talk more about religion, or do they talk more about celebrity and gossip? Yeah, yeah. They probably tend to talk more about the latter, yeah, which yeah. Is, I'm not saying that's a terrible thing, but, you know, they are more interested in Big Brother 5 and all the other stuff that goes on. Um, the, um, the point being that, it's, a question I'd like to ask you is, how do you... How do you become detached from that? How do you focus on the core? How do you focus on saying, well, actually, maybe that's fun, but it shouldn't really affect me? Yeah. Because subconsciously, it will affect you. At one point, I think you start seeing the, empty, the emptiness of it. Mm. Um, for me, it was very, very interesting when I first started coming here to Sangat. I had this ideal image of, oh, when I go to a, a Sikh family or I hang out with a Sikh friend, we will all be talking about the Vaiguru, and we will all be talking about Sikh. And then you see the reality. No, you're just going for dinner. People are playing PlayStation. Um, that's the reality of it. Mm. And it sort of bothered me greatly, because I had the feeling, but I've been there, and I stepped out of it. But then again, it, you have, I've gone through the journey, and everybody needs to go through the journey and find for themselves, whether it's empty or not. If your parents are telling you, or if somebody in a good world is telling you, it's not going to make any difference. Okay. It's what I believe. My belief is that you go through these things and suddenly you realize, you know what, it is not bringing what I'm, what I'm looking for. What I'm looking for is something else. But Vini telling me, or Kutpri telling me, that is what you need, will never have an influence on me, or will not have that lasting impact um, on me to go into something. It's self-realization. The, the, the thing is, it should be made available because for a lot of people, they will be looking for the other thing and they can't find it because it's not available. So I think that's the responsibility um, of parents, of good others, mm. make it available to the youngsters. Okay, because but don't push them point. into it because it will, mm. have the, it will have a completely different um, I think that's an excellent point because I think I often, I feel, if I go to Gurdwara, if I, if I go to a, a religious place of work, like, and I think I've said this before,